So good, so good. Well, happy Mother's Day to everyone here watching online and everybody in Knoxville. We are one church in two locations, and so we're excited about all of our moms. We're excited about uh, last month, over the last four weeks, our church has been serving our community here in Blount County and in Knox County, and uh, we had 915 people serving, and so that is just incredible, incredible. So thankful that we're a part of a church that, that serves in that way. And our small groups, they serve those, uh, those communities and they serve those organizations all throughout the year. And so uh, we're really, really excited. That's more than double uh, what we had last year. So I'm super excited. And then also, uh, we had $160,000 given towards the vision offering to go to the counseling center and the property across the street. So that is awesome as well. It's super, super helpful. And uh, we're excited to t take that next step. June the 1st is when we're supposed to close on that. And so uh, we'll be transitioning uh, in the very near future. It's already almost June. Can you believe it? Um, if you've got a Bible, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 6. We are going back to our series called Who is Jesus? And uh, we're going through the gospel of Luke. And so we find ourselves in uh, chapter 6 today. You know, I think that's a great question to ask your friends uh, when you're trying to have uh, gospel conversations, when you're trying to uh, really talk about spiritual things, is just to ask your friends, who do you think Jesus is? And I think oftentimes when we ask that question, we're often going to hear from people, well, Jesus is a good, good teacher. He was a, a good moral teacher. And I'm sure that you've heard that from time to time, but I want to encourage you, if you ever hear that from someone, just follow up and just say, okay, well, what, what do you think he taught? And usually when you follow up with that type of question, it's silence, uh, because people don't, don't really know what Jesus taught. They just kind of use that as a slogan that they've heard, you know, from somebody else, and so they just use it, you know, to you, and, and they don't really know. If they do know anything, it's something real generic, like, you know, well, we're supposed to love other people or the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done to you. And that's, that's maybe a popular uh, concept. But, but other than that, what did Jesus teach? And I think it's uh, intellectually dishonest to call someone a good teacher if you've never sat in their classroom. <laughs> and so I think it's helpful for us to have conversations with people like this to begin to help them think about this because I, I just think C.S. Lewis's concept, I, I know I've shared it many times, but it's worth repeating. When, when it comes to a man like Jesus, he's, he's either what Lewis called a liar. He was just lying about the whole thing the whole time, about, you know, being the son of God, being the Messiah and, you know, raising from the dead. He was lying about the whole thing. Or he was a lunatic. This is a crazy man saying that, you know, we should do these things and love people and, and he's going to, you know, again, raise from the dead. Or he's actually the Lord of all creation. Those are really the three options. You either call him a liar, a lunatic, or he is in fact the son of God and he is to be Lord of our life. And, 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 and to call him a good moral teacher and to not know what he taught, I think is dishonest. And so I want to encourage you to have these types of conversations, and today is a great day to begin to equip you on what he actually did teach, and today is probably one of the most popular things that he did teach, one of the, one of the greatest moral teachings of Jesus. And in Luke 6, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, at least that's what we call it, and it's the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever preached. Jesus is teaching a brand new morality. He's teaching us a brand new way of life. And if we're, we're to follow him as disciples of Christ, then we are going to embrace this teaching today. And so in Luke chapter six, we'll pick up in verse 27. And here's what he says. He says, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. 
Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Now, I imagine most of you have heard this before, or at least you understand the concept, but can you imagine uh, on the mountain that day, if you are a first century Jew, you're listening to this rabbi teach this message, and he says, love your enemies, right? We ask this question, who are we supposed to love, Jesus? And he says, love your enemy, And I just imagine listening to that uh, for the first time and thinking, what are you talking about, right? The, the, The Romans have invaded our country. They hate us. You know, they treat us like dogs. They rule over us with a heavy hand. And you want me to love them? How on earth uh, can we possibly do this? Why would we actually do this? Now, he's not talking about a romantic love here for our enemies. He's not even talking about the kind of love that moms have for their children. Uh, That would be impossible. He's not calling us to love in that way. The Greek word for love, your enemies here, is the word agape. Maybe you've heard that. It's more of a godly type love. And what it means is it's the kind of love that that we are deliberately making a, a decision to reject feelings of hatred. We're we're not letting ourselves hate that person. When those feelings crop up of bitterness and anger, we're saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to let that burn inside of me, right? We're deliberately making that decision to reject those kinds of feelings, bitterness that we might have towards them, and we're determining to have goodwill towards them. Right, we're, we're determining that we are going to be kind to them. He's not saying love your enemies like you might love your child. That definitely would be unnatural. But loving our enemies is a love that no matter what they do to us, we will never desire bad things to happen to them. We will not go out of our way to be unkind to them. In fact, we'll go out of our way to be kind and to be good to them. This is a radical love. This is a radical way of living our life. Jesus is calling us to a higher standard. Love your enemies. Now, when I say love your enemies, and and, and this, I'm going to ask you a question. Whatever pops into your mind, whatever the, the Lord reveals to you, this is the person, okay? This is the, this is the step this week. Who is your enemy? Is it the guy at work that drives you crazy and is trying to, you know, uh, be uh, mean to you or whatever? Who's your enemy? Is it your ex-spouse, your ex-wife, your ex-husband, right? Do you view them in that way? Is your enemy someone who has a different political view than you? Have you categorized a whole group of people as your enemy. Who's your enemy? He says, love them. This is a radical way of living, but this is the the way of Jesus. This is the, 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 what it means to be a disciple of Christ. He raises the bar, the standard, uh, as we continue in verse 32. He says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. What he's saying here is that loving your family is, is, is no big deal. You're, in God's eyes, that's not bl- uh, going to bless you, right? That's, that's, that's like required. That's just like normal to him. He goes a step further, and he says, if you love people that love you, that's worthless in his eyes. 
He says, even sinners love their family and friends. Your love for people who are, are good to you is not going to require supernatural intervention from the Holy Spirit. What's gonna require supernatural, Holy Spirit-driven love inside of you is the kind of love for the person who you would consider to be your enemy. You're not gonna get a blessing from God if you love your family and friends. Jesus says, look, that's, that's, uh, that's just kind of a normal thing. Even sinners, in other words, even non-believers love their family and friends. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to have a life surrendered under the lordship of Jesus to love your family and friends. Even ungodly people love that way. But what Jesus is calling us to is a love like God loves. It's a love that is not self-interested. It is selfless. To love like God loves is to love our enemies, people who do wrong to us, people who hurt us, people who talk badly about us. And that, my friends, is going to require the supernatural Holy Spirit change within our heart, within our spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can change us to love people in that way. You're not gonna get there on your own. You're not gonna be able to motivate yourself to love in that way. And so what this means is, this is really, really challenging. It's really difficult. So why would we even try to do this? Why would we ask God to do this? Why would we be motivated to do this? And let me give you three reasons from this text. We're motivated to love our enemies first and foremost because that's what we want from them, right? So the golden rule, as you wish that others would do to you, so you do to them. So when you're hurtful to people, when you do something wrong against someone accidentally or intentionally, when you're a jerk, right? When you do things that, you know, are out of your character, but you, you know, you were, you were frustrated and you just kind of lashed out. When you do something wrong, when you hurt people, what do you expect from them? You expect them to forgive you. You, you don't want them to chop your head off and, you know, call the police. You want them to forgive you. You want them to love you. You want them to give you the benefit of the doubt, right? And because you expect that from others, He's saying, extend that, that kind of understanding to your enemies, right? Secondly, because we're gonna receive a great reward. In verse 35, he says, your reward is gonna be great. Now, I know oftentimes, uh, legal, I find that it's more legalistic Christians that say, well, we're supposed to do good because that's what God calls us to. But over and over in the Bible, Jesus, the apostle Paul says that, if you do these things, you're gonna get rewarded. And so there's this idea that I think it's a, it's a good motivation that we realize that when we, when we do what Jesus is telling us to do here and love our enemies, he's saying you're gonna be rewarded. He doesn't say how we're gonna be rewarded, but I think the excitement and the motivation for why you would forgive someone that hurt you, why you would do good to someone who intentionally talks bad about you and and, and who you would say, I think this person hates me. They don't like me at all. Why would we bless them? Why would we do good to them? I would say, Jesus, Jesus would say, you're gonna be rewarded. So let that be a motivation. And that is a very good and right thing for us to think about. And then thirdly, we're motivated because it's gonna prove that we're God's children, right? And you will be sons of the most high. So when we love in this way, it's proof that we're followers of Jesus. Now, some of you are like, I don't know if I'm a Christian, you know, I prayed, you know, but I, I don't act like it. And people struggle with, you know, did I really give my life to Jesus? Am I really gonna go to heaven, you know? And, and so that struggle is there. And, and, and I think one of the greatest proofs that you are a child of God is if you are loving in this way, because again, it's not gonna come natural. Sinners don't love in this way. People who, who, who don't love Jesus and are surrendered to Jesus, they don't, they don't love in this way. And so if you're doing this, if you're praying for this, if you're pursuing this, I think it's a proof. He says here 
You're gonna be sons of the most high if you live in this way. So if we love our enemies, we're gonna, we're gonna do really well at loving people, right? I think one of the questions is, you know, why would he say love our enemies? And I would say, if you can love your enemies, you're gonna do fantastic at loving everybody else. And so I think he starts by saying love your enemies, but I think what we see in this passage is, is essentially how do we love people? Because you might not call your kids your enemy moms, but there are times when they get pretty doggone close to the line, right? Can I get an amen? You're not gonna call your husband an enemy, but last night he was a jerk, right? I mean, what do you do? So, so what I wanna talk about today is, is how do we love people, right? How do we love people? And, and I think the first thing that we see here, he gives us a few examples, is essentially be willing to do good to those who hurt you. This is what loving people looks like because people are people. People are gonna hurt you, whether you're, they're your family, your friends, or your enemies, they're gonna hurt you. So if we're gonna love like Jesus is calling us to love, we're gonna be ready to love those who hurt us. And he gives us a few examples here. In verse 27, he says, do good to those who hate you. Do good to those who hate you. So that means be willing to serve them. One of the reasons why we serve our community, we serve in this way, right? This is a way to love them, right? We serve in some uh, organizations and they don't necessarily hate us, but there might be people that are working for that organization that don't like Christians or they may not like you, right? And so we serve in that way. We, we are willing to be kind to them. We are willing to talk kindly to them. Right, We refuse to gossip about them. We refuse to talk badly about those people. Right, we, So we hold our tongue and we instead use our words to, to bless them. Do good to those who hate you. That means forgiving them, letting them off the hook. Right? Not holding that bitterness inside. Verse 28 says, bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. So if you accidentally pull out in front of a car this week and they honk their horn and they flip you off and they are cursing you, right? You just say, bless you, brother. <laughs> just wanna bless you, right? And uh, I think that would be a, a good response instead of what we typically wanna do when that happens, amen? Verse 28 says, pray for those who have abused you. Wow, this is hard stuff. Following Jesus is not easy. Right, that's why just coming to church, like that, that's not checking the box for God. <laughs> the standard that he's calling us to, the standard that's gonna be, bring reward and blessing and joy into your life is getting to a place of love like this. And so if we can pray for those who abuse you, this is uh, people who have hurt you, people who has called, called suffering into your life. Again, you're not gonna do this on your own. This is gonna take the intervention of the Holy Spirit into your life. And I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, I pray for them, all right. I pray that fire rains down on their head and they lose their job and they lose everything, right? That's the prayer. That's called an imprecatory prayer. Now, you know, that's, those, are, those are there in the Bible. You can pray judgment on people, but I think what Jesus is calling us to is a different kind of prayer here. It's a prayer of blessing over them. So he says, bless them, pray for them. Do good to them. And you cannot love like this without the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 29. Verse 29, it says, the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. So this is the famous turn the other cheek passage that I think gets uh, misinterpreted more than any other passage. I think there's a few, uh, there's a top five that get misinterpreted in the Bible. And I think this is probably one of them. He, he doesn't, mean, and he's not talking about getting physically attacked here, okay? So, so if you get physically attacked, he's not saying offer the other cheek. Here's an example. If you go to a football game this fall and, you know, someone, you know, you're walking down the street and some guy punches your wife right in the face, that is not the time to say, honey, turn the other cheek. 
Husbands, there might be a thought that creeps in on that. You've got to reject that in the Holy Spirit. You've got to reject that thought, right? No, that's the time to throw down, man. That's the time <laughs> to defend your wife. You need to punch, kick, elbow, whatever. I'm giving you everything I got. You might get me, but I'm giving you everything. It's going to be a bloodbath, right? And that is a good and right thing to stand up for yourself and to uh, protect yourself. He's not talking about physical protection here. He's talking about an insult. So in this culture, he's talking about a backhanded slap. So the backhanded slap in that culture where you would not, it wasn't a punch. It was like this this insulting way of just degrading someone to just kind of smack them on the cheek like that. And so this was an, uh, an insult that you could actually take another Jewish person to court for if if you wanted to. And so this is the type of thing he's talking about. It's a slap. It's an insult. And so what we take from this is that if you are insulted, Jesus says, show yourself to truly be my disciple by the way in which you bear that insult, you bear that hatred, and you overcome evil. You overcome this injustice, and you do not uh, offer an insult back, right? So if you want to take notes, it is essentially be willing to take an insult without insulting them back. And so what's our natural instinct when someone makes fun of you? Make fun of them right back, right? When someone says something degrading to you, the instinct is to go right back at them. That's our culture. That's what we see on TV, That's what we see on social media is to immediately insult them back. Jesus says the way of love is different. We don't offer an insult back. This is an incredible application to our marriages, right? How quickly would you dissolve some of your arguments if you just simply live by this? I'm not gonna insult you. You're not gonna insult, like we're not gonna do that. Let's figure out what we're talking about here, go to a deeper level so that we can, in fact, love each other. Moms, if only your you know, eight and nine-year-old brothers and sisters could get this concept, right? Life would be easier in your family. Um, I think Jesus is talking about retaliation here. He's talking about revenge and retribution. And so Paul summarizes it in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He says, do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. For it is, it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So when someone insults you, someone hurts you, if, you're, if your instinct is to get them back, to retaliate, Jesus would say, you're you're not gonna get them back no matter how good your one-liner is, no matter how good the insult is, no matter how how great the, the dig is, you might win the argument, right, in your mind. But he says, I'm telling you, vengeance is not gonna be won. You're not gonna get them back. It's not gonna make you feel better. They're not gonna feel worse. You don't win a trophy when you win the argument, right? Essentially, what he's saying is, I'm the one that, that takes care of business here. I'm the one that settles the score. You're never going to settle the score with the argument, with the insult, right? And so he says, let, let me handle this. I'll make sure they get taken care of. I'll make sure that vengeance is taken place. I heard about a, a smaller man who walked into a bar and uh, He's sitting on the bar stool, and this bigger, uh, real, real big uh, bully of a, of a jerk walks in and sits beside him and decides to mess with him, and he, he slaps him right across the neck, and he knocks him off the, off the stool, and, and uh, he looked at the man, and he said, that's karate from Korea, and laughed at him. The little guy didn't retaliate. He just got up, sat back on the chair, and a little bit while the the bigger man, the bully, decided to mess with him again, and he walked over to him, and he, and, he, and he picked him up, and he threw him over his shoulder. He said, that's judo from Japan. Laughed at him again, and the little guy got up. He left for a minute. 
He came back in, knocked the guy on the head, knocked him out. <laughs> he said, that's a crowbar from Home Depot, right? <laughs> Again, sometimes self-defense is warranted uh, and it's necessary. It's the right thing to do. But the point of Jesus here is to take an insult without insulting them back. So let's recap. How do we love like Jesus is calling us to love? Are we willing to do good to those who hurt us? Are we willing to take an insult without insulting them back? And then look at verse 29. He says, and from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Now, this is a weird law in the Jewish culture. I mean, you, 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 sometimes you read the Bible and you see some weird things. You're like, why in the world do they have that in there? But you know, the reality is we have some weird laws in Tennessee as well. I don't know if you've ever checked the books on this, but I read of a few this week. It's illegal to use a lasso to catch a fish. I don't know who did that and what happened to warrant a law, but something happened. It's on the books for a reason. Some idiot was out there on the river and, and tried something, right? Another one is that no Christian parent may require... That their children to pick up trash from the highway on Easter Sunday. I don't know. Maybe a kid got injured or we're just, you know, maybe abusing kids back in the day, making them work too much. I don't know. Sounds like a good idea to me. And then lastly, if you steal a horse, it's punishable by hanging still to this day. So be careful. Or don't, don't cross the line. <laughs> Those are some weird laws. In this culture, it was possible to sue someone for the very shirt off their back, right? You could, you could actually take their cloak from them. And, and, and that, in a court of law, uh, was, was possible. But one of their weird laws is that you could not take their cloak for a permanent 24-hour period. It was such an important piece of clothing that they used as a, as a blanket at night and, and all other kinds of things in, at that time. They didn't have closet uh, you know, filled with clothes, so it was an important part of their wardrobe. And so you couldn't, you couldn't even keep it for a 24-hour period. So even if you were sued and had to give them your tunic, that person had to return it to you before you went to bed. And so I think the point here, at least what I am reading, is that we've got to be willing to get worse than you deserve. Right? So if they take your tunic, offer them your cloak as well. Be willing to get worse than you deserve. That is what love actually does. Jesus is saying, if they sue you because of your faith and they win your shirt, go ahead and give them your tunic as well. Even if they legally can't take it away from you, go ahead and offer it to them. Folks, that's a radical love. That's the kind of love that is meant to point people to Jesus. That's what gets people's attention. And I'm just afraid that in our culture today, Christians by and large aren't offering this type of love. But if we do, imagine the impact that you could have upon the people in your work environment and in this community. We could have such a love like this that would point people to Jesus in this way, be willing to get worse than you deserve. Look at verse 30. He says, give to everyone who begs. If someone takes something from you, don't demand it back. Give to everyone who begs. So fourthly and finally, I think what he's saying here is be willing to give all that is needed. Be willing to give all that is needed. And so if someone has a legitimate need, right? It's a legitimate need and you have the ability to meet that need, I think Jesus is saying here, be willing to give all that is needed. Now, some people are gonna ask selfishly, and, and that doesn't mean that you're, you and I are required to give you know, everything that is, that is asked or some, you know, someone who begs us for money or even if it's our kids begging us for money for, for this or that. He's not saying that we're required to to uh, give to every foolish or selfish request. Sometimes giving hurts people. And so we do have to be careful about that. I remember uh, long ago, a guy came to our church one, one day and 
gave me the big sob story during the week about how he lost his job and he's trying to get to a different state and this and that and the whole story and, and uh, said he just needed some money so that he could eat. He, he hadn't eaten in days and, and he needed money to eat. And so I said, well, I, I don't have cash on me, but what I'll do is you can go to Arby's, order whatever you want. It's right around the corner and uh, I'll call him and I'll, I'll pay for it on, on, on my card and, and uh, take care of you. And boy, he got so mad. He got upset and started saying, you know, this is what's wrong with the church today. They just don't want to help people. And why can't you just give me what, what I'm asking for? And, and of course, he wanted to use that money for whatever. It wasn't food. And, and uh, sometimes we run into that in our, in our culture. I don't think that every person, every homeless, so-called homeless person on the side of the road who's begging for money, I don't think Jesus is requiring us to give to that person. Because again, sometimes giving hurts. And uh, if we're, we're giving to that person, maybe it's, it's hurting them uh, to enable that type of lifestyle. But if it's a genuine request and it is uh, a genuine need and you have the ability to fulfill that need, and, and again, this is gonna have to be your judgment. This is the Holy Spirit working in our life and, and uh, speaking through us. And, 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 and it will be up to you to make that decision uh, to help. But when you can and when it's a genuine need, I believe Jesus would tell us to give all that is needed, right? Now, all of this, uh, loving people, it is not easy, right? This is, this is hard teaching, Jesus. This is next level living, praying for those who hurt us, right? Blessing those, doing good to those who don't like us. Uh, We're called to love our enemies. And on top of that, we're loving our spouse and our kids and our coworkers. This is a difficult way of living. But I believe Jesus is telling us this because he wants to reward us. He wants to bless us. And he wants to show us what life can really be like when we have a heart of love instead of a heart of bitterness instead of a heart of anger. We need to start acting like we love people. If we're, if we're wondering, do I really love this person or how, how do I get started? I would say start doing good things for that person. Start blessing that person. Start being kind to them. Start acting like you love them. And then the feeling will, will genuinely come later on. If you're waiting for the Holy Spirit to kind of sprinkle fairy dust, Holy Spirit, you know, over your life, it's not gonna happen. You're not just gonna automatically start loving people. We've gotta pray for this. We've gotta ask God to give us a heart of love. We've gotta ask God to allow us to forgive those who have hurt us. We actually have to start doing kind things to people. And in that way, our, our, our affection will follow. Watchman Nee was a pastor in China in the early 1900s. And he told the story of a Christian man who owned a rice paddy, and right next to him was a communist man who owned a rice paddy as well. And the Christian would irrigate his land by pumping water from the canal, and and he would sit on what kind of looked like a bicycle, and he would have to turn his legs to to pump water into his field. But every day, uh, when he, after he would do that, his neighbor would remove the boards in his field, which would release the water from his field, and it would flow into his field. And so the Christian man saw this day after day, frustrated and upset. And so he prayed, he asked God, he said, God, what am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to respond to this? And the Lord gave him an idea. The next morning he woke up, he removed the boards from his property and he started to turn those legs and he started to pump uh, from the canal and he filled his neighbor's uh, field first. And after his neighbor's field was filled after a couple of days, he put the boards back in and then he continued to pump water until his own field was filled. That one act of kindness against someone who was hurting him changed everything. He talked about how the men became friends after that. And even not long after that, the man actually became a Christian. You see, that's the power of love. When love does, when love moves, when love works, and people see that type of response and action, that changes people's opinions about Christianity and about who Jesus 
is. That's the great example of what it means to love others. But, you know, I think another great example of what it means to love others is, is our moms. Moms are a great example of love. Moms love and show kindness, even not only to people in the community, but even kids who might hurt them. They know what it's like to love when they're insulted by a teenager. They know what it's like to get worse than they deserve. And they know what it's like to give all that is needed and then some. Moms still love when toddlers throw a fit in the grocery store. Moms still love when toys are scattered, juice is spilled, and dad is asleep on the couch. Moms still love when she becomes a professional chauffeur and a full-time cheerleader. Moms still love when teens decide that they don't want to talk to her anymore. Moms still love when rooms don't get cleaned and dishes don't make it into the dishwasher. Moms still love when gifts are not good gifts on Mother's Day. Praise God. Moms still love when no one says thank you, hello, or goodbye. And moms still love even when they're gone. Her love always carries on. When children stray and words like arrows find their way, her love stands tall, fortress strong, enduring the storm no matter how long. Though she may falter, stumble, and fall, her love remains through it all. I think the love that we experience through our moms is probably the closest we'll experience this side of heaven, the love of God. And I think, obviously, the greatest example of love is is Jesus. Jesus, in fact, came to die for those who hated him, who insulted him, who spit on him, who beat him. And though they mocked him and they abused him, he said, Father, forgive them. They whipped him and he didn't say a word. The Son of God allowed all of this to happen, even While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is the greatest love we will ever know and experience. And once you know the love of Jesus Christ and what he offers to you, then and only then can you love in the way that Jesus has called us to love today. You cannot on your own. You cannot without the Holy Spirit in your life love in this way today. And so maybe you need to give your life to Christ. Maybe you've never trusted him for salvation. I'm gonna give you that opportunity today. Would you just bow your heads and if you need to give your life to Christ today, maybe you're here with family, you've never done that. You've never recognized the fact that the cross was where Jesus is dying to pay for your sin so that you could receive forgiveness and not only have that forgiveness, but you can have eternal life. If you'd like to make Jesus the Lord of your life today, would you just simply say, God, I confess that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sin, that he rose from the grave. And I commit my life to him today. I make Jesus the Lord of my life. I believe you prayed that prayer today that even right now, the Holy Spirit is filling you, changing you, and we wanna know about it. We wanna help you in that decision. We wanna help you take that next step of baptism. We wanna help see the Holy Spirit and God do great things in your life. We'd love for you to stop by what we call the care and prayer room. Every week we have volunteers in there ready to help you with decisions that you wanna make and pray over you. It's always available every single Sunday. Today, we're gonna close with a song. And as always, this isn't a time for us to leave early. This is a time for us to process what we have just heard. This is heavy, weighty teaching from Jesus. I wanna ask you the question, who is your enemy today? Who do you need to love better today? And as you pray and as we sing This is the moment, this is the time for you to forgive someone, to pray for that person that has hurt you. This is that time for you to put this into motion, into action. What would you do 
this week to begin to change how you're treating the people around you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we need your help. We can't love like this on our own. Moms can't love like this on their own. Dads can't love like this on their own. We need you. God, you just, would you just move in our hearts? Would you move in this place today as we process what we've heard, as we process the things that are, are being taught to us? Lord, we don't wanna leave until you're finished and we know you're still working. And so God, would you just have your way in this place? Do what only you can do. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for watching this message. We hope you enjoyed it. We post our messages every week right here on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe so you can see the latest videos each week. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this message. So leave us a comment and don't forget to like the video. It really helps us out. As always, be sure to follow us on socials to stay up to date on all that is going on at FC. We'll see you next time.